I would like to introduce our first speaker uh, for this evening, and his name is Nico Camara. Uh, Nico joined our trust uh, earlier this year and manages CNI's Liaison Psychiatry and Perinatal Services team. Uh, his presentation will cover the role of Liaison Psychiatry and how mental health should be considered on the same level as physical health within the health and uh, care system. And he will outline what the trust does, but also help raise our understanding of mental health. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you for inviting uh, me to come and uh, share with you um, what the uh, liaison services are doing and to bridge the gap between uh, physical health and mental health. Um, so, you have heard, my name is Nico Camera, um, and I manage the, um, the interim operation manager for uh, liaison services and perinatal services in Camden Islington. What I aim to do to this evening, I believe I've got about 20 or so minutes, I aim to share with you um, uh, what liaison psychiatry is. Um, I know, I'm not too sure whether everyone knows what liaison psychiatry is, and um, have a quick discussion about um, uh, the prevalence of mental health uh, in people, that is, uh, um, people, um, is uh, people with physical health conditions and uh, those without physical health conditions, and sort of outline the case for uh, bridging the gap. And um, I would try and I would state to you what liaison psychiatry is doing about that, and something about our aspirations for the future. So, liaison psychiatry, it basically deals with the uh, interface between physical and psychological uh, health. Um, what it is, is it's a group of uh, mental health practitioners that are based in an acute hospital that assess patients who present in a &E, uh, or patients who happen to be on the ward with physical health condition or who come to outpatient clinics um, with physical health conditions, they step in there, they go and assess their mental health needs and together provide a collaborative care plan. So why is it important we do that? Um, it is from no health without mental health, it's worth noting that. Compared to the overall population, a higher proportion of people with long-term physical conditions have additional long-term mental health problems as well. So what Carl um, uh, was saying is uh, when people talk about uh, mental health, they think of the main ones. But we, from the statistics, we know that people who have got a long-term condition, they will be worried they will be anxious, but some of that goes for a long time without being picked up. So it is our role as liaison service to work with our acute trust colleagues to, 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 to uh, identify those people and support them right from the beginning. So the next important um, uh, point to point is from the study that uh, we, I, I, I picked up, about uh, roughly about two-thirds of hospital beds are occupied by people over 65, and of this, about 60% will or already have a mental health condition, which is dementia, delirium, and depression. Some of this is, to, like delirium, it, it is to do with the amount of medication that one person can be on, so it can contribute to that, or infection. So really, why should we be bridging this gap? We know there is a high prevalence of mental illness in physically unwell patients, we know there is an increased length of stay in acute beds if mental illness is not treated alongside physical health. We know the longer people stay in beds, uh, the, in acute beds, then the more the cost uh, to, to the service. Um, because some of uh, the people will already start losing their ability to and confidence to go home and function, then that leads to packages of care being organized or people being um, uh, alternative arrangement being uh, sought. We know if someone is mentally unwell and that's not treated, even compliance with their physical health treatment, medication, or working with the practitioners can be difficult. But without stepping in there, we help that 
and then compliance with their physical treatment increases, they get treated quicker, and then they can go home. We also know that there will be poor quality of life if we don't address that. So how did Camden and Islington ended up working in UCLH? We have got a service level agreement between Camden and Islington, and uh, your local um, team here, the UCLH uh, Liaison Psychiatry Services, based on the fifth floor, um, comprises of a multidisciplinary team, which is the consultant psychiatrists, some junior doctors, mental health nurses, students um, also come in, and also medical students come in as well and, and be a part of the team. What do they do? They provide the comprehensive psychiatric assessment for the people that can present in those three areas I mentioned before. <laughs> Psychiatry consultation in terms of asking any questions that the doctors and nurses on the acute wards might have, which they want answers. Um, they contribute to the psychiatric treatment of the patients that have been identified to have a mental illness by uh, suggesting medication that can be used or through talking therapies. Then there is a, they can also support with onward referral to other agencies like in Camden and Islington. For the patients that are in the catchment area of Camden and Islington, we know better which services are there because we often hear that it's like navigating a maze if we start looking for services, especially in a trust that you don't work with or you don't normally operate, operate from. So we can support with that. Uh, obviously, our electronic patient records are shared by the community team. So the moment we do any piece of work in a &E, we then that's already acceptable to other community teams. We support um, with management of patients who could be brought under Section 136 and the teaching of mental health. I'm going to focus a little bit about on the teaching. So teaching and education is aimed at ensuring mental health is the same parity of esteem with physical health within the healthcare system. We know that if uh, someone uh, walks in uh, in an a &E and say, I've got a chest pain, the nurse in a &E or the doctors in a &E automatically um, think of a lot of things. They think of ECGs, they think it could be a heart condition, There's the, the, the alarm start ringing. But with mental health condition like depression, it's not, we don't feel it's the same. It is our duty to educate uh, uh, people uh, who work in uh, acute trust about the link between physical health and, um, and mental health. We support the people working on the acute trust to, under, to, recognize, to, to recognize patients suffering from mental health at a very early stage. Ideally, when they are being triaged, ideally when they are being admitted, then we're in there to, to, to a, joint, a collaborative care plan. We do, a, we do a lot of work on stigma and discrimination, supporting our colleagues that they are aware what is stigma, what is discrimination, and what impact it has got on uh, people's uh, recovery. Then the management of the three Ds, depression, dementia, and delirium, is something as liaison services we should work heavily on with the uh, acute ward staff. So when it comes to teaching on the signs and symptoms of mental illness, our hope is if we do it so well, the moment someone walks into the department, then the nurse who's doing the triaging should immediately be able to, like as much as the mental health professional would do, assess and see from what the person is saying, how the person is presenting, and how they, are, they, 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 they tell their story, whether there is need to be inquisitive and ask those questions that can identify issues like anxiety, depression, uh, or any concerns. Then immediately they refer to us. Then while at least they are still there, we can start our own interventions as well. This is so important because over half of all the cases of depression in general hospital settings go unrecognized by physicians and nursing staff. And there is a variety of reasons why this happens. It's because sometimes people don't know what to look for. If you don't know what you don't know, there's, you don't know what to look for. Also, we know there might be a pressure to do the, the, the interventions in a and &E. We know they, they, there is a high demand for uh, seeing people within targets, for our targets. But what we say to our colleagues is, if you just pause to spend another 10, 15 minutes 
to understand the needs of this person, identify any mental health issues, you could save on, ho on hospital stays, you could save potentially on hospital acquired infections if they happen to be there, and also you could actually support the person to go back to their own house in a timely manner, we, while at least they are still able and confident to do that. So we raised the issue of comorbid uh, co co mental health issues and the challenges of identifying some of the mental health problems due to symptoms overlap. Someone is already in pain, maybe they're not sleeping well. People could normalize that and say, well, you're in pain, you can't sleep. But no, it might, might be actually someone is actually depressed. If they may not eat well, sleeping, not eating well, could be signs of things are not going on and, and someone is depressed. So we raise the awareness of that. Stigma, it's something that we also focus on. The reason we do that is sometimes people don't know they are being discriminatory or they are actually, in, they, they, they are stigmatizing uh, an individual uh, through how they talk, how they relate to someone. Um, that, so we raise all that awareness. And we know we will be saying to our colleagues, if you don't give a good experience when someone, if there's someone with a mental health condition doesn't have a good experience of using the a &E service, the inpatient service, then it, they stop becoming confident coming up there, then listening to social isolation, not being able to access the services, and that impedes on their recovery. One of the key things that I, I couldn't resist talking about is recovery. I'm very passionate about uh, mental health recovery. Um, in, in my previous life, I did some work on the host families. Um, I don't know whether you've heard that. It's a bit like foster caring of uh, people supporting them uh, so that they can recover, stay in the community. Recovery is central to mental health provision. And I would read this statement, recovery is a personal process of overcoming the negative impact of psychiatric disability despite its continued presence. It doesn't mean that someone is, uh, is hearing voices. It is not for me as a practitioner or my colleagues, donor and uh, colleagues, to say they should be symptom free. It depends on the individual. Some individuals just want to achieve certain things in life despite the, the, their mental illness. So it's about instilling hope and hope should be instilled at whatever stage someone's journey is. If I'm this person who is so anxious, uh, I've got um, a phobia, and I str really, really struggle to get out of my house, or I've got uh, paranoid schizophrenia, and I'm paranoid about people, but through the work of my colleagues in the community, they encourage me, if you feel unwell, at any time of the night, go to the a and &E they will be looked after. The moment I go there and I tell the triage nurse that I'm Nico Kamera, I suffer from paranoid schizophrenia, I hear voices, commanding voices, and immediately they change how, how their body posture, or they start scribbling very fast, and immediately they pick up the phone and say, uh, some statements we hear, we've got one of your own here, and then we say, look, it's not one of our own. This, this, this person comes to here to get help. Or we could start asking questions, and they say, look, so how long have they had their voices? And sometimes, not necessarily on this hospital, I've worked in other hospitals, you hear someone say, hold the line, how long have you had their voices? So the patient is there. This is, we are saying, you might say, I'm not, I'm not discriminating, but in a way you are, because this person has made a connection with you, shared this story with you, why are you relating that story while they are there, at least offer them somewhere quiet to sit. Some people prefer that because there's so much going on. Offer them quiet to sit, have a conversation with us, then we take it from there. So the key thing about our colleagues is recovery is working on treatment and rehabilitation in collaboration with the providers. The acute trust are the providers. At that point in time, that person is there. They are also the providers. Let's join forces to work together. So education is very crucial to, to what we do. So what we aspire for the future is we want to do this better. Uh, we want to expand the service to what's called the ILAT model, um, integrated liaison assessment and treatment team model. 
uh, those who know the Whittington, this model is at the Whittington. Um, some people have heard of the RAID model. There are currently conversations happening outside this in, in various capacities where we are expanding this. We, we hope if that could be extended to UCLH um, and or the Royal Free, we should be able to do more enrich work. The ILAT model how is different from the service that says there's got more bodies on the, on the ground. There's a more a multidisciplinary team. We can have psychologists in the team and uh, they will be able to, to do more enrich work. Um, at the Whittington, for example, the, the, the nursing team and the medical team should go around the world twice in the morning in the evening, trying to have conversations with the nurses and the medical people. And they, when, when we talk of referrals, we don't want just for people to, to, to wait uh, until they, uh, they, 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 the treating team identify where issues are. We want to walk up there as well and have a conversation with the nurses. Who did you admit yesterday? And through their story, they said, oh, Mr. So-and-so came in. He was so disheveled. We heard from the people who brought him in that um, the things at home are uh, not so well. Then we start saying, OK, but why no one normally lives like that? Can we start having a conversation here? So we educate the, 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 the professional on the spot. We also then proactively pick up, pick up the, uh, the referral. So we'll be able to provide more education and support, increase awareness, mental health awareness to the same level as physical health if we do that. And finally, we should be able to contribute to an effective, efficient, and safe care plan for the patients and the people we serve. Thank you. I'm Sorry. very pleased to introduce uh, Donna, Donna Adcock, who's a senior matron at UCLH and um, in emergency services. And I've met Donna many times, A&D and also AMU. Yes. And, um, and I can vouch for the fact that I've observed <laughs> Donna being extremely patient-focused and wanting to get the highest possible care for patients in that part of the hospital. Evening everybody, thank you for inviting me to come and speak to you today about the emergency services and how we help bridge the gap um, with the care of patients suffering with mental health problems, challenges. So my name is Donna, I'm the Senior Matron for Emergency Services. I've been in post since November of last year. Um, that is in post in emergency services. My background is primarily emergency operational matron roles since about 2001. I've been in the um, NHS for 30 years. Um, well, 30 years next year it will be. Um, so it's a pretty long time. I've worked overseas and I am absolutely passionate about mental health and the way we as general nurses um, provide a supportive service with a holistic focus to all of our patient groups. So my role as matron, um, I'm going to go through this. I don't want it to be death by PowerPoint, so I'm not going to read everything that's on my slides. Um, I think a matron role um, should be an influential role that exemplifies um, the, the, and inspires leadership at all levels by epitomizing the standards and values built on expectations of our patients, the public, our employer, and our profession. My aim as a matron is to bring together the nursing strategy, um, bring it to life by engaging, empowering, and leading by example. Um, I aim to provide and to support my teams to provide a world-class patient-centered, high-quality care service all of the time. Um, and I appreciate that we don't always get it right, so forums like this are great to have some feedback um, on how you feel that uh, we're doing with things. So the scope of the discussion today, how do we care for patients presenting with mental health difficulties within the emergency services di uh, division? We like to think that we provide a holistic assessment more importantly, and probably the most important thing for me, is that we like to think we see the person behind the individual in front of us. Um, we like to think that everybody feels they're treated like an individual um, and that 
we see them as a person and not a number, not a patient, not a disorder. Um, and that is the way forward, I think, for us in emergency services, just taking some of the rough edges of what we do um, and, and taking a little bit of a softer approach so that we give our patients a sense that they're seen as the person that comes through the door rather than the patient that is here for a, a fix, physical fix, and then we move on. How do we do that? We're building in pathways, we're building in supports, and we're working, multi-agency working. Um, we're working with partnerships, right, well, throughout all of emergency services division, um, and that includes the inpatient areas within all sites of UCLH. So, there's a question. We talk about caring for the person, the individual, um, we talk about um, seeing the person who's in front of us. So I'll ask you to look at this photograph. Um, the question is, what do you see? So just hold that thought. We'll come back to it. Um, and uh, hopefully they're pleasant ones. So partnership. We need to talk about how we, as UCLH Emergency Services, work in partnership with our patients and with um, CNI. We absolutely want to be sure that our patient is part of that partnership. It's not CNI and UCLH, it's the patient, UCLH and CNI. So we, we use the term multi agency working. What is that? Um, it's a group of professionals that work towards a common cause. We have a central, a patient as the central focus. The patient is included, always included as part of the team. We deliver a service by using sustainable pathways mm -hmm. and we aim to provide a seamless transition between services. So whether that is statutory services or non-statutory services, we aim to promote seamless working. So the patient transition is prioritized. The benefits to the patient um, of multi-agency working. We like to think we empower our patients, um, that multi-agency working enhances communication, and um, we focus as a team <coughs> on supporting the person, not the problem. We think that from um, the patient's perspective, we like, to, we like to think we promote independence and that we work together to provide a safety net where it's required for the benefit of the patients. So the benefits of ourselves working with um, C&I, we, again, we think that the service helps us value people as individuals by working together, learning together. We promote self-worth, not just for our patients, but for our staff who have to deliver the services that um, we aim to provide. We like to engage all aspects of the multidisciplinary team, all aspects of community social support services. Um, we feel that we can demonstrate credibility by working as a team and working with people such as yourselves to get feedback on your experiences and make positive changes on the back of that. We like um, to acknowledge where things are going well and we also like to be clear on where we need to consider to, that improvements should be made. We work on the basis of respect and empowerment, and again, not just for our patients, for our staff. We like to advocate, advocate for our patients. Um, and sometimes that does open up some challenging discussions within the agencies that we work with, but with the patient as the focus point, that's always very constructive. We like to facilitate open discussion um, and we like to challenge boundaries to practice. There are boundaries, there are ways of thinking that we need to overcome. Um, and as Nico highlighted, education around that isn't just specific to one team or one area. We do need reminders and we do need to consider how we approach things. And we need to challenge one another in doing that. Um, we need to create opportunities for improvement in care. Um, we need to 
see our patients as the people that come through the door, but understand how we communicate with them and understand what their perception of us is in reality. Um, we need to be able to demonstrate a willingness to rationalise decision making. And that's not just to one another, that's to our patient group. The patients need to be able to understand why we're taking certain decisions. We need to spend time at the bedside or in the room where they're having the assessment done to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, and to, to really consider whether our patient is in agreement with that. We need to bring organisation organizational values to life by that what I mean is we all have we have trust values in UCLH every caring organization has values we don't want our values to be something that are printed on paper they're on letterheads we want something that lives every patient that comes through the door we should be kind the epitome of kindness um, we should be safe um, in our practice and you know we should constantly be working as a team we should constantly um, be striving to achieve <coughs> improvements in what we do and how we approach things <coughs> so challenges with the multi-agency working um, we do experience challenges organizationally we have environmental challenges um, as you may or may not know, a patient coming into A&E, it's a very busy area. We do have our challenges with lots of people coming through. It's noisy. Um, it's not always the most pleasant place to be. Um, operationally, we have our challenges. We've referred to our four-hour target as such. Um, I like to think that it's the four-hour target um, is a quality and safety initiative um, to maintain quality and sustain safety. Four hours is the optimal time to get somebody through emergency services, um, to be seen, assessed, treated, and then have a plan to move elsewhere. That in itself does give us some challenges. Um, we see increasing numbers of complex patients coming through the door and shortly I'll move on to the pathways and um, try and outline a little bit as, as to how we approach some of those complexities as a team. Um, length of stay, again, we could consider that an operational challenge. Um, length of stay in the department, length of stay in the um, AMU. The situation there is that length of say again is a quality um, target. The longer somebody remains in hospital, the more likely they are to have further complications. Um, we monitor performance and that is something that we do at UCLH, that's something that um, C and I do. And we have regular monthly meetings where we sit down and we look at performance to see how well we're doing. We measure our performance on a daily basis and we review that um, just to see where we're doing well and what, what we need to do to improve things. And again, that is a challenge. And by that, I mean the challenge is that we're looking at performance indicators. We're looking at numbers. That has to translate to patients. Um, and so the clinical team, the operational team, are the people that try and translate that into something that's meaningful for both the patients and the staff on the ground. What um, do we look at when we're considering quality assurance measures? Our standards, quality, all primarily are based on safety, but there are challenges within that when we're working as a team with a joint organisation partnership working. We need to be sure that we're meeting all of the standards across the board. Um, and then we also have to look at forecasting and projecting service delivery requirements to ensure that capacity meets demand and continues to meet demand. From the patient perspective, the challenges working between two or three different services, communication, is obviously one of the biggest challenges. Um, number of professionals involved with one patient's care 
um, is always a challenge to be sure that we're being cohesive and consistent with the response and the approach that we're using. We sometimes see repetition in care um, and some of the controls and limitations that we might apply um, at UCLH when we're assessing and reviewing patients are potentially something that the patient hasn't experienced before. Um, that in itself is an inconsistency that does give rise to some concern. Um, we've got active involvement in decision making, um, whereby, again, I understand that mental health services have been actively involving patients on a very detailed level for a number of years. We have got better at that in general health, in acute health, but actually we've still got a lot to learn. Um, also, the emotional needs, acknowledging emotional needs for the individual. The one thing that our patients do feedback is that they feel they could do with more time. Um, and time at the bedside, time when they want to talk, not when we want to offer it. So all of that taken into consideration, you know, there are a number of challenges um, that we encounter. So how do we work together to provide safe quality care? We look at pathways, um, mechanisms for standardising care. It sounds pretty, um, pretty structured. So the question is, how do we standardise care um, and still keep it individualised? So the pathways um, is a term we use quite frequently in healthcare. A pathway is a means of getting from A to B in a safe way so that we're being consistent with our approach and communication. Um, but the pathway itself is individualised to meet the needs of the patient, the person at the centre of it. Um, how do pathways help? They help us deliver a service so the patient knows what to expect. The person delivering the service understands what they're providing and when it needs to be provided. And how do the pathways support individualised patient care? The patient should be involved with that pathway. The patient should be the person to have the support to drive that, depending on their abilities. They need to be involved at every level, every step of the way. So how do we promote safe quality care? Consistency. You know, it's no good delivering care if your care plan changes every time you attend and yet your condition hasn't. Safety, always top of the agenda. We like to promote cohesive, multidisciplinary and multi-agency working. And again, you know, that isn't just a phrase. We have to talk to one another. We have to use the available systems that we've got that can communicate, so we can facilitate safe and efficient, speedy communication. Um, we have to be clear and we have to be sure that we understand what we're doing and we've explained that to the patient group. Um, we have to be certain that we've outlined expectations and that we're providing the right level of care at the right time, in the right place, but more importantly, it's been delivered by the right team um, for the patient. Without that, we're not going to, without that um, approach, we're not going to deliver a safe service to our patients. So how do we standardise a complex issue? Um, again, the pathway is, is standardised, not our patient. We don't expect the patient to conform um, to a specific standard. We look at the patient as an individual. We look beneath the surface. We like to think that when we have a patient come into triage, our initial response is to ask them what the, the, ask them the reason for their presentation. Um, we like to think that actually our patients don't feel that they're considered um, uh, as an injury presenting at the department. They're, considered a person um, and that when they explain what they're there for that we listen to them and that we hear what's being said. We 
listen to what our patients are telling us, we reframe the picture and we feed back to confirm our understanding of the presentation. We then um, like to progress our assessment one step further by creating an alert for the mental health team um, if we feel that the patient is in need of further assessment. And importantly, if the patient has, has requested further assessment. So our pathways. A patient presents at the emergency department. We carry out an initial assessment um, and, tr and that's usually carried out within the triage area. That triggers an alert to the mental health liaison team, oh. at which point we will give details of the assessment and the mental health liaison team are aware that we'd like some support in assessing the patient. From there, we take our patient through into the main department. There are several areas of the emergency department and we reassess the situation, we reassess the presentation. Um, as you can understand, we often have patients that present with chest pain, um, injuries, and quite often they present with a, treat with a condition that needs medical treatment. We always ensure that that patient's medical treatment takes priority. There is no delay to the patient's treatment. At the same time, what we do is we make a referral to mental health team, the liaison team, and ask them to come down and make an assessment, an initial assessment of the patient. The mental health liaison team come into the department, make an initial assessment, and depending on the treatment plan, the medical treatment plan, they determine whether they are able to assess the patient at that point or whether they need to come back to reassess a couple of hours down the line. Once our patient has had their treatment, some of the patients transfer up to the medical assessment unit. Um, those patients are the patients who have a need for ongoing medical care and they're placed into a bed. The medical care goes along the lines um, and are, are, as per plan by the consultant and the medical team with continued input from mental health liaison team. When the, medic, when the patient is medically cleared, what we then do is hand over to the mental health liaison team so they can fully assess the patient and determine the plan of action as to whether that patient is discharged or um, moves on elsewhere. So as you can see, there's a fair few variations on the theme. Um, I've gone through the first three steps along the pathway. Um, if the patient remains within the emergency department and is deemed medically fit for assessment, we have a transitional assessment facility within the department. That is um, a, a facility that has three rooms. Um, the three rooms are key to making an individualised assessment of the patient. Um, and what we do, we take the patient into the room, they meet with the mental health liaison team, and there's a robust assessment of that patient. Um, the patient explains how they feel, they have privacy afforded to them. Um, we've taken them out of a very busy department and we've given them somewhere that is quiet, somewhere that they can actually take the time to have the discussion with the mental health liaison nurse or doctor. Um, that is something we've received a lot of positive feedback from. Um, and again, we do have challenges with that, but it enables a robust assessment that meets the needs of the patient and we take the patient into the area that's deemed appropriate for a mental health assessment. Um, so the quality of that assessment is deemed to be far better than an assessment that would be carried out in the emergency department behind curtains as it may have been done in the past. So what do we put in? Um, from the UCLH perspective, um, we work with our community partners. We work with security team to ensure that the um, patients are supported and managed appropriately. Um, we have specialist nursing resource that we pull in. And by that, what I mean is we have um, the ability to call in 
um, RMN staff or healthcare assistants where it's deemed a patient needs support on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, that quite often takes place in the AMU, so the Medical Assessment Unit, and um, quite frequently many of our patients are supported 24-7 by an RMN. Um, we put on specialist transport for transfer of patients um, between facilities where needed. And, of course, we have the AMU team um, who are a very, very good, um, high-quality nursing team with, I think, four or five senior sisters. Um, we have mental health liaison service who are available to us both in the ward areas and ED. And then we have the ED team, all of all who have some degree of um, mandatory training or update around how to care for patients, mental health patients in the emergency setting. So, given that I've spoken a lot about the patient, seeing the person sitting in front of us, um, what I would ask you to do kindly is to look at the photograph. Um, if I were the patient presenting, and this is me, um, this was a, a Florence Nightingale service I went to. If I were the patient presenting, what, what would you see when I turn up at the door? A smile. So, from my perspective, what I can say is that when I look at that, the same way as when I look at my patients, I see a nurse, somebody's mum, somebody's aunt, somebody's sister, somebody's daughter. I see somebody that looks happy, may not be. That smile may not be real. It may be something that is there to get by. Um, all in all, I think what we need to be sure of is that we treat patients the way we'd like to be treated ourselves or the way we'd like our loved ones to be treated. Um, and sometimes that does mean looking beneath the surface. The nurse in front of you on the photograph has worked 30 years in the NHS. I've got some mental health experience as a nurse. I've encountered mental health um, challenges within my own family. Um, so the experience that I've had is not necessarily the experience you see when you're looking at the photograph. And that's the approach I've used with my team. Um, again, only been there since November. We are trying to move things forward. We are trying to ensure that the service we deliver to our patients meets their needs and supports them to move from the emergency services into the next step of their care if it's needed. Um, and that, again, quite often is the mental health services and um, assessment by our colleagues at C&I. So I, I do feel that, you know, we don't always get it right in emergency services. We are trying very hard. Um, and the approach that we're using is very patient-focused. We're still learning. We're learning from C&I. We are learning as we go. Um, and your input, your questions and your feedback is very, very important to us. Thank you.